Welcome back to Under Pressure, the business building podcast for the pressure washing industry. Today, we are very excited to bring you Ron Musgraves once again. Ron, thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. Love the love the podcast. I mean, love the love what you guys are doing out there, and love the growth of your channel. That's awesome, awesome stuff. And thank you so much. And one of the really exciting things with this podcast is that we can interact with the audience. And we can bring them the, the business side of this industry while also getting their questions. So one of the questions that keeps coming up on Facebook and actually was from your group, Pressure Washing Friends, which check out that group. If you're a pressure washer who has not heard of Pressure Washing Friends, check it out. It is massive and it is highly engaging. A lot of, a lot of great content on there. A lot of crazy people too. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. But that's everywhere. So one of the best questions that we've gotten a couple of times from, from some members of the audience is, how do I start from square one? So obviously, Ron is a little bit removed from square one. He's been in this industry for a long time, and it's tough for him to go back 37 years to the beginning. So my thought today is we'd get Ron's perspective on how would you start a pressure washing business square one? in 2022 if you were to start all over again. wow the first thing i'm gonna the first thing i'm gonna say is the biggest piece of advice i can give somebody stop listening to 10 guys and trying to implement the best from all 10 guys um you're gonna wind up broke and you'll be calling me up six or seven months later broke and not having any money to do any marketing and then asking me what's the magic formula um what you need to do first and foremost is you need to decide what you're going to do in this industry. This industry, I don't think people realize it, it, it's so huge and so vast. You can wash bus stops and make $6 million a year. You can wash kitchen exhaust cleaning and make $98 million a year. You can do fleet washing. Uh, Fleetwash.com, you guys want to check this out on Dun & Bradstreet. It's a six million dollar company okay did you know that i did not 756 million they're almost to a billion dollars in revenue isn't that crazy that's you a know? lot of million and, and i remember when we were watching them back in the early 2000s they were getting to the 100 million mark and we thought wow that was a lot of that was a lot of money um and now we've got a company that might be a billion dollar pressure washing company um <clears throat> you know the first thing not to get off on that, is to figure out what you want to do um, and focus on that. I, I can tell you right now, the, 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 the jack of all trades, master of none, um, that, that folds out there that if you want to try to be that guy, and I know there's a lot of guys out there, oh, let's add this service. Let's do a dryer vent cleaning. Let's do that cleaning. Let's do this. Man, they're doing so many things, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, at the day's yeah. end, somebody calls them, and they don't even know what they're, they're, they don't know what they're trying to sell the consumer that's calling them because they have 19 million services out there that they're trying to provide. Focus yeah. in. This is big piece fights. Focus in on that one thing and do it and do it well. If you're going to be a house washer, be the best damn house washer you can be. And yeah, there are other things you can do, but don't get caught up in installing a fence for a client. Wash houses and stick to doing uh, washing houses. You're going to wind up you're going to wind up making more money than trying to be that jack of all trades, master of none. Um I, mean, I love that you brought that up, Ron, because one thing I have to just interject in there is that you hear all the time, jack of all trades is master of none. And you got to you got to you got to focus on that. And I'd say that's where step one starts. When you realize that, then go out there and find the education that you can get educated on this. Yeah, there's lots of great business building books out there that can help you with the business side of it. But you need some real application hands-on training because here's the reality of this. If you cannot do this service efficiently and effectively, this is going to affect the bottom line. I mean, uh, your production rate is where all of your money is made, the money that you keep, the money that you put in your pocket. And you have to be good at your craft because – it, it, it matters. And lots of guys out there go, no, I build, I'm, I'm, I'm building a business and I'm working on the business and, you know, squirting water is just squirting water and you don't need to know anything. That's not a big deal. 
Trust me, it is a big deal. A bigger deal even to have those systems in play for washing so that you can scale and train people to do the things that you're doing so that you can get larger as a company. You have to have a good idea of what you're doing in order to be able to do that and scale up from there. But let's not get into scaling. We're talking about a one guy, one truck thing right now. You need to get that thing built up and you need to do it. Now, the next thing I'm going to tell you is, is when you got that, when you when you when you found that person to get that training from, um, you're going to have a better idea. Don't buy that equipment yet. Everybody always jumps in and says, "Boom, let's buy this equipment right now and let's get rolling." First of all, if you roll back to the first thing I said, you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> and and you may go out and get the training on washing bus stops or kitchen exhaust hoods and say, "This sucks." Well, if you spent $50,000 on a kitchen exhaust system to clean kitchen exhaust, you're stuck now cleaning kitchen exhaust systems because you put that investment out. Wait. We're going to get along to you when you should buy the equipment. So we we chose something we want to do. Now we went out and sought training for it. Okay, we like it now. Okay, we like what we're doing. Are we going to buy the equipment yet? No, I'm still not buying the equipment. Okay, Um this is the next thing you need to do, and you might want to be doing all this simultaneously. You, you want to get every social media account that you can open up in your business, every one possible. YouTube being probably the number one, Facebook being number two, and then every other one that you could do, make sure you have some, some type of reach. Guys say today, I don't need a website, and I know there's guys out there that say, you don't need a website. I probably was a guy that said 20 years ago, I don't need a website. <clears throat> what a website is right now, it's just a consumer confidence thing. If you build a website and you put a website up there and have a web presence, it's a place that a consumer can be assured that, hey man, this isn't just some Facebook page. And if this guy comes out and destroys my house, we have an actual, we have an actual website that's built that links to him. So it gives the consumer some uh, some more confidence and trust in you that you're just not a fly by night company. Plus, Absolutely. web pages, web websites can be directly related to how many years you've been in business and there are smart consumers out there that know that and as your business gets older, people are going to look at that and go, "Hey man, this guy's been doing this for 15 years, 5 years, and that's going to mean something over your competitors." Maybe not when you're new, but it's going to mean something down the road. So you want to get that established right away. It also gives you a hub for all of your social media to be linked into because hey, let me tell you a little secret. We don't own Facebook. We don't own Google. Uh, and those things over, over the course of my 37 years, first of all, they weren't invented uh, when I first started, but they've changed and um, they change daily. And sometimes you don't want to put too much stock in one thing particularly, and all of a sudden you wake up in the morning and all of a sudden you're not there anymore for whatever reason. And they own it, so they can take you off of it, they can move you around on it, they can change the algorithms, uh, and you don't want to put all your stock in something like that uh, as far as mm -hmm. your business goes. You want to put your stock in something that you own and that you control, okay? Yeah. So yeah. we've got, we, we decided what we're going to do. We've done the training now. We've got our presence online established. <clears throat> now, guys say all the time, I'm not going to try to tell guys that don't, don't try Google AdWords, don't try Facebook. Those are very powerful tools. I would say you try them all, and you try them all in moderation. Also, look at my video about using social media advertising so that you better understand what's important about it. We don't have a lot of time to get into it here, but in hiring the right guy, I would learn some of the basic things if you're going to hire somebody to do it. Learn some of the basic things. If you're going to dig in yourself, definitely remember this one word, pixel. Study that word and understand what a pixel is, and that's going to help you understand and keep you from getting ripped off if you do decide to hire somebody. Um, so we've, we've done that now. We've got that all out there. Now you know for certain you want to be a house washer or you want to be a bus stop washer or whatever this is that you want to do. You know, you want to build your social media presence towards those things. Now you probably have had a better idea of what type of equipment you really need, what's not going overboard with it, what's not 
you know, an entry level machine. You still don't want to go out there and spend, there's no need, anybody in this industry and distributors hate me for saying this, no one needs to spend $50,000 coming out of the gate. You should be able to get into this industry, man, as little as $5,000 and moderately maybe twelve or 13000 okay? And from there, you can work on building something. If you want something more elaborate, if you think you need something more elaborate, you'll probably find out you don't. And if you'd listened to this podcast and really took this to heart, you're going to be, you, you'll, you'll be calling me after you've opened up in six months and saying, man, thank you. I was going to spend 50000 and I don't even like to clean houses or I don't even like to do kitchen exhaust cleaning. Um, mm-hmm. So go out there and invest yourself. Now, you could reverse it out and say, hey, man, I'm going to wait to see if I can get some jobs. And you could even try to rent equipment. I've done that before. I, I did that when I first started. I rented the first piece of equipment that I, that I did, and I rented them for quite a while. Um, it, was, it was quite a while that uh, I was able to uh, establish jobs, get regular accounts, and then I was able to purchase the equipment. And I actually made the right purchase because I did that. Because if I had bought that equipment right at the very beginning, I would have went overboard too, and I would have bought yeah. something that I didn't need. So I kind of stumbled on it. For the basis of when I was younger, I was broke. So I didn't have the money to buy the equipment, so I had to rent. But it all worked out in my favor that that was probably the better thing to do. Um, Marketing-wise, man, you, you know this. You, there's, there's, no one, there's no one marketing thing, is there? I mean, if you're doing no. one thing, but, but I will tell you the mistake that most people make. People do a lot of marketing, and then they get busy, and they're so busy that they forget to market. You need to have your marketing on automation. Marketing mm-hmm. needs to be automatic. Marketing is, marketing is always going like this, and you're always going like this instead of doing this. And if you yeah. find yourself where you're busy, you're not busy, you're busy, you're not busy, come back and watch this portion of the video again because I just told you, you've got to continue to market no matter how busy you get. The marketing can never stop. And there... Yeah. and. And, list, and believe me, there's no one magic bullet. Marketing and, and, and creating sales and creating that revenue is a campaign. It's a campaign of multi-things that you're going to have to get set in play and set in motion and do it. My suggestion to you as a new person, don't put stock in one thing and don't overspend on one platform. Spread, you know, spread, out, the, spread out your money a little bit evenly. Now, if you've have got better performance with something that you're doing, increase the spending to that marketing mm-hmm. a little. Guys don't realize that sometimes when you increase the increase the spending, it doesn't always l- lean the same results because you think, oh, well, I put $150 towards that and I made $10,000. Let me put 1000 bucks towards that and I'm going to make 50000 It doesn't work like that. Yeah. One of the best ways I heard it put is that um, marketing here in the, in this regard is a volume knob. What Ron's saying about about staying here, staying level, I love that because you can use marketing to keep you level. If there are times where things would get quiet and you would go down, just turn up that marketing and you'll stay even. If it would go up and you don't have the capacity for it, turn it down and you'll stay even. But yeah, stay consistent, absolutely. And I love what you're saying about um, really just trying out different things. Don't put all your eggs in one basket because as with everything else in this, whether it's costs involved of starting or what equipment to buy or or how to structure your business, at the end of the day, it's going to be different for everyone based on who they are, what company they are, and what their goals as a company are, and what market you're in. So you can't really just put your all eggs in one basket for marketing. Uh, you really need to try out different things in your market and then lean into what works, what's most effective. Mm-hmm. But Ron, so one question I yeah I, I want to I want to add this on. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people are afraid to talk about. You know, do I do I need to get a coach? Do I need to do something? Do I need to do this? And I want to explain this to to guys. And this isn't a pitch to to sell a coaching brand or anything like that because I do it for free. So if you you, you want to yeah. give me a call up, you can give me a call anytime. We can talk about anything you want to talk about, and I can steer you in a, in a, in, a, in a good direction that you might be you might be the best for you to go towards. But you know, we sit there and we people don't realize that there's more than just the knowledge of the coach. 
we go to the gym, right? And when we mm-hmm. don't get results, what do we do? We stop going to the gym because we don't have any accountability to ourselves. We don't have enough dis- self-discipline. Man, everybody is guilty of this in the world. I mean, there's a lot of guys out there that really believe that they're that, that, that they're self-disciplined, and that's a great attitude. But 99% of the people are not, okay? They're not. And when somebody's paid to be your coach, they're going to hold you accountable. When somebody's not paid, they're not going to hold you accountable. Because I will tell you, I'm a free coach, okay? And I will tell you that you need somebody to hold you accountable because I'm not going to do this. If you don't listen, I basically won't I won't pick up the phone when you call me again. You know what I mean? Why? Because you're not paying me to, to, to yeah. instruct you. So I want to I want to explain, guys. Now, if you're a, if you're a real self-disciplined guy and you want to call me and you want to work with me, that's great. But the minute you don't do something, I'm cutting you loose. Where if you've got a paid coach, they're going to they're going to be the ones that, "Hey man, get up, Ron. You know, we got to get this done. You know, you got to stay on track. We got to stay focused. We got goals, yeah. blah 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 blah. You know, let's get over here and get 10 more push-ups, blah blah and f- 50 more sit-ups." And I'm using the the trainer analogy as it's the same thing. You got to go out there and knock on 10 more doors. You got to go make 20 more phone calls. You got to send a hundred more emails. That's what a, that's what a coach is going to do is going to hold you accountable. They're also going to give you a system of the way that they are actually doing the sales. And this is where I went back and said, most people, the mistake that they make is they try to listen to 10 people and try to funnel in all these great ideas from 10 people when they don't understand each one of those pe- each one of those instructors or each one of those uh, business persons they had their own system that worked and the reason that their system that worked is because they compiled the techniques together to get the end results not that so and so has a really good idea here and Jimmy has a great idea here and Susie has a good idea here and then you think you're going to incorporate that and it doesn't work sales is like you said is a funnel it's a spigot and we we we've got to know how to generate leads from marketing um and and, and such but to actually close the sale that's a whole nother skill, right? I oh, mean, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a whole nother skill. Yeah. Now, some guys will tell you they've got programs online that close while they're sleeping. They'll close jobs while they're sleeping. And you know what? There's some truth to that because consumers have gotten lazy and they want to be able to buy things easily. Yeah. And so there is some truth to that. And you got to make that buying process easy, don't you? Oh, yeah. You can't make it you difficult. Have. And that's what we call user experience. And one one other thing about user experience uh, that I want to bring in here is, is something you'd mentioned throughout, really, which is like the idea of social proof. What you were saying with the website and stuff like that. How how do you nurture that? You're just starting out. How do you make it so that when someone you you're talking to someone, you, you're marketing, and they're looking into you, how do you make it so that they see who you are, what you're about, that you're legit, basically, your legitimacy. Is that with a website and a Facebook and a solid quote? It, is it all that? It's it's actually going out there and making not commercials, but real videos. Mm-hmm. Real videos of you out there pressure washing or you filming your crews out yeah. there pressure washing. But not a not the stick man, you know, cheesy commercials that we think of, you know, uh, that 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 we were that we grew up watching on television. The entire the entire process of marketing has changed. Nobody wants to see that anymore. They do mm-hmm. want to watch a 10 or 15 second satisfying video. And that's where mm-hmm. we come into play with that because we can deliver that. Now, now whether that's going to get you a customer, I've argued with a lot of people over it. It'll get you a lot of views from a lot of people that don't want to buy stuff, but but the but but it's it's cool when you get a million views on a on a on a on a hit and then there might be one person out of that million that actually needs your service. Um, I and and and, and I don't want to get into that argument because it is an argument. And uh, so the bottom line is, though, is like you were saying, you do got to get out there and be real, be in front of the customer uh, on your social media platforms. And that's why I said you're going to create these social media platforms because when from the from day one, and I don't care how rusty you are or how stupid the videos look. 
people can look back at those and go, wow, this guy's come a long way. And you know what? And he's real. And I can rely on him. I can trust him. And the reasons why is because your customers are right down there leaving reviews. They're leaving reviews. <laughs> From the first one you did that looks janky to the to the last one you had just done where everything looks a little bit more polished, right? I mean, yeah. your 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 truck wrap looks a little bit better. You might be in a uniform now. Cause guys, you don't really you don't really need all that stuff when you start. It, it's it's cool to have it and to get it and always make your brand look better. But I want to I want to tell these guys this right now. You're and this is perfect. Look, yeah. man, you recognize that logo? That oh, logo is yeah. recognized in over the universe. Okay, what do they spend eighty billion, eight hundred billion dollars, or something like that? It's some it's some ludicrous amount of money on marketing. So we all know what that logo means if we see it. Okay, you don't got no, you don't have ten ten thousand dollars you normally to spend on marketing. Branding is cool and it's good, but the person I always tell everybody, you're selling you when you start off as 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 what well, you want to call yourself, Chuck in a truck or Bucket Bob or whatever you want to call yourself. Yeah. You're starting off as you. So you want to be Ron Musgrave. So every customer that you go up to, you're Ron Musgraves or you're Bob or you're Jimmy. That's who they're going to remember. They are not going to remember. They are not mm-hmm. going to remember that logo. They're not going to remember it, man. I'm sorry. You can think your logo is the coolest logo in the world. What is it? What does they say that 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 that, that has to retain? How many times does it have to be put up? What did what, what do the marketing experts say, Jake? Um, like three times, to- wait, like see something like three times or something like that. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's more like eight. I think it's like eight times you got to see that. You know, first of all, yeah. you putting up eight times, even if you charge 500 bucks for a house wash, you want to try to get the logo in front of that person eight times. You, you, you yeah, might, right. where's, where's all your money in the house or the house wash is going to have to cost what, 1500 bucks? <laughs> yeah, you know I mean? so that's something I want to get into as well. Is how do you figure out what your pricing strategy would be? If someone's just starting out, and like, how do, how do you decide? All right, is it based on your competitors in the market, or based? I on have your never, I have never cared about the competitors in the market. I don't yeah. worry about what their prices are. When somebody hits me with, "Well, so and so will do it for you know seventy five <laughs> bucks." I'm like, okay, you know, give me his number because I got a bunch of other jobs I'd like to hire him for too. Uh, yeah. But I, I can't do it for $75 because, you know, we're going to tell him I have workers' compensation. I have liability insurance. You know, uh, everything's covered here. If, you know, guy falls off the roof, guy falls down, breaks his legs. You know, your homeowner's insurance is not going to get sued. My, my insurance is going to take care of it, which a lot of people, a lot of homeowners don't understand that. And I think even businessmen don't even understand that, that, well, ma'am, we're not we're not required by law to have workers comp. Uh, but if I fell off your roof and died, my wife will be collecting death benefits from your uh, homeowner's insurance policy. You know, and and, and when you, and when you talk to somebody like that, they're like, oh yeah, really? That, that, and they'll they'll call their own insurance agents and say, yeah, you can't hire somebody that's not legit and have have that. We we don't you don't want them on the property, or you're going to be responsible for it. And I think yeah. people people don't 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 understand that. But that's that all comes into. Uh, you know, when you start selling yourself, and this is this is part of the the coaching ability and some of the more the business building strategies and things like that. That if you wind up getting a coach and you wind up getting a professional coach or a free coach, they're going to tell you about those things and how you how you're going to add value to that stuff and how you're going to get more money. But back to the original question, Jake, how do you know? Here's how you know: you have to know your production rate. And it's pure science and math, guys. It's mm-hmm. nothing else. And once you've established what your production rate is, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more in depth, Jake, because everybody is not a gold medalist, okay? You're not going to have guys out there that are going to be championship house washers or bus stop washers. You're going to have some guys that can't even place. They might have came in ninth place, okay? Now, do we want all gold medal guys? Absolutely. That would be the ideal thing. That way we would be the fastest and the most efficient, and obviously we'd make the most money, right? Because if we're charging uh, Mm -hmm. by science, if we're charging X amount of dollars per square foot, and we know Jimmy is is a gold medalist and he can get it done in double the time that Jake or I can get it done, well, we're sending him out to do every house wash, right? But the reality of it is, 
that doesn't happen. You have what is called an average of what they're going to do. And the simplest way to explain this to you is, is if everybody thinks that Starbucks, every Starbucks sells the same amount of coffee, they're out of their minds, okay? There are Starbucks that are low-level selling Starbucks, and guess what happens to them? They get closed. If they don't, if they don't meet a, a certain requirement of how many cups of coffee that they sell, Starbucks closes the location. Starbucks is only concerned with the average over all their units. If their averages between all their units are what they are what they're expecting, they're happy. If the only way they can keep that average is to cut some of that dead weight out of their program, which means the Starbucks that aren't cutting it and they're not selling coffee, they're going to have to close them. And that's what they do. That's the game that's played. You're going to find yourself doing that same thing with employees. You're going to have to say, okay, Jimmy, I'm sorry, but you know, it's not working out. Um, you know, you're just not, you're just not effect, fast and efficient enough. And I'm sorry, we can't use you, but hang on before you let Jimmy go. Find out if he has any other talents that he might be able to help you out with in your organization because mm -hmm. I've found out that sometimes, sometimes guys that you don't think – we had a guy that couldn't see. He was legally blind. We didn't know he was legally blind when we hired him. And when you, a guy can't see when he's cleaning – that's a bad thing, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's a bad thing. And we, it drove us nuts because we thought he could see because he had glasses, right? And and apparently the prescription was as strong as it could possibly be, and he still couldn't pass an eye test with the glasses. Oh, and wow. uh, and so we, instead of firing him or letting him go, we, we asked that question, and it wound up the guy had this other talent that we were able to utilize, and it was a phenomenal thing. And wow. he more than made the revenue stream for that talent tenfold because he, 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 it was something that he was very good at, but he didn't want to do. But when it boiled down to it, he realized that when he was working in the right position – doing it and he could do what he wanted to do he actually loved doing it and we made the job we made the job good for him uh, you know basically but we brought him back to his original profession i'm not going to say what it was but we yeah, brought him back yeah. to his original profession that he got out of but he found out that it was the it was the atmosphere that he was in was the reason he didn't like what he was doing and once we got him in the saddle and got him back doing it he was like wow i'll never not do this again for the i'm going to do this for the rest of my life you know, I, I love I love that story because there's a huge lesson in that that as you're starting a company and you begin hiring, you can't hire someone and then find a job for them. What you have to do is say, "What's the vision of my company?" You have to say, "This is the job I need filled," and then you have to find the person that plugs into that. Is that right in your experience? Absolutely, Ron? man. Absolutely, yeah. He, I, I I've got a video out there, man. Salespeople don't stuff envelopes, and uh, it was funny because we had a gal. That uh, we had a gal that th there was there was some gals that they didn't like being on the phone and this is so technology is coming along and now all phone calls are recorded and we didn't even know this this woman was on the phone for like two years and we started playing these calls back now that we could hear and we're like are you kidding me did she really say that you know I, I, I mean she hated being on the phone and so we had to go like we we, we were like Susan. What's going on, man, on these calls? She says, man, I've told you since I started doing this, I can't stand making those calls. <laughs> you know, I, was like, I was like, we're like, Susan, well, what do you want to do? You know, and she goes, if I could stuff envelopes all day, I would stuff envelopes. And we would have, we would have envelope stuffing parties, you know what I mean? Like in the office because we'd oh, send yeah. out mailers. So we'd get everybody in the office because nobody likes stuffing envelopes. Finally, Susan loves stuffing envelopes. We're paying her at home while she's sitting on the couch stuffing envelopes. And we never had to worry about the envelopes ever again. And she loved doing it, you know? And she's like, I'll stuff envelopes all day if I don't have to ever get on the phone again. We're like, hey, man, you never, after we heard those calls, you ne we don't want you near the phone. <laughs> that's, you know? that's great. Like, but so, she she loves stuff in those envelopes. That's amazing, and that's just th that's a perfect story. Also, yeah. that highlights that you, that you have to be aware of what's yeah. going on. You have to take a second to look around and smell the roses, right? Yeah. yeah. So, as you're starting a business, everyone, of course, also needs to accept payments. And so we're going to take a minute to hear a word from our sponsor, Pair Payments, a payment processor that can help you accept payments at no cost as well, with no fee processing. 
All right, we'll be right back. You certainly can't afford to give profit away for no reason. But what if I told you credit card processors may be overcharging you and robbing you of profits you've worked hard to earn? It's time to put an end to being overcharged for payment processing. It's time to take back your profits. That's why we put together a free report, How to Avoid Being Overcharged by Your Payment Processor. Head over to TakeBackYourProfits.com, download the report, and put an end to being overcharged for credit card processing. You've worked hard for your sales, and you deserve to keep it. What are you waiting for? Go to TakeBackYourProfits.com and download your report today. All right, and we are back with Ron Musgraves, who's given us so far a great uh, look at how to get into the business from square one. So, Ron, we were just talking about you know becoming a legit business and some of the things you were talking about with pricing strategy. You were talking about becoming a legit business and liability insurance, workers' comp, and then I also got the question about filing an LLC, all that. So, what do you think is the let's priority? tackle let's tackle the LLC first? Okay, first yeah. of all, take that take the LLC paperwork and put it over to the side here. First of all, you have no idea that you're going that you need to be an LLC, okay? The only thing an LLC is going to do is going to uh, it's going to protect assets. Maybe mm -hmm. assets that you don't have or you do have, it's going to protect assets. But if you're a single uh, operator out there and you're operating yourself, you can wait and make that decision, get through your first year tax liability, and then decide what you want to become. Decide mm -hmm. if you want to become uh, if you want to become the LLC or not, and that'll be based upon your advice from from whoever it is is helping your tax planning or your financial planning, saying, "Hey, this is what you want to do because you made this amount of money. Here's your tax liability, and we want to definitely and we want to definitely do that." I would definitely, um, you know, invest. I would definitely get into the liability insurance. We explained to you before, if you don't have the workers' compensation, even if your state says you're exempt, there's going to be a problem because you're going to have a competitor like me that's going to use the workers' compensation, and we're going we're to tell the customer that they're in a liability if you hire somebody on the property and they don't have it. Even though the yeah. law says they don't have to, it, they're still, they're, it means that they're accepting the liability. And we're going to put that in their head, and that's going to give us the lean on charging more. We're going to be able to charge more because the bottom line is the co consumer is going to have more confidence because they're going to say, hey, we're hiring Ron's company. Honey, somebody falls off the roof. They're going to be covered. We're not going to have a claim on our homeowners, blah, 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 blah. So definitely having the proper insurance and things like that. I would say that you probably need these things from the, from the word go. Um, what was the third part of your question? Um, Liability insurance and workers comp, was that it? Yep. Oh, the, then the prioritizing. Oh. How would you, yeah, how well, would you prioritize? Well, I mean, I, like I said, I, I, the, we, 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 we put that one on the thing. Get the liability for certain. You know, you need to get the liability. If you want to wait, if you think you can outsell the guy like me selling the workers' compensation, hold off on the hold off on the workers' compensation. But the minute, guys, the minute, the the very second that you get a nut, that you get an employee out there, even if you're allowed to have them exempt because of the wages that they're making, if they're minimal, I would still get the get the get the workers' compensation insurance and get it for yourself too. Get it for yourself. A lot of guys don't realize that it's not that expensive, and if you get hurt, you need to be included in that thing too. And I'll tell you another one that I would definitely get. I would get I would call some company like Aflac, and I would definitely, if I had kids and if I had a wife. I would get the the the, the disability the short term disability and death. It's very minimal. It's like a couple hundred bucks a year. And those policies, if some accident happens or you get temporarily disabled, they pay up to like eighty thousand dollars on something that's very. It's a very small small amount of money that you have to pay annually. And at least if you get hurt, you're going to know that your wife is going to be able to have a transition time period that, hey, my husband's in the hospital in a coma, but I got an $80,000 check right here. I can pay the bills, feed the kids, you know, and get them to school. If, I, I think that that is a plus. Now, I don't know who you should go to because I don't have a guy. I have a guy, but I, I don't have, uh, I don't, I don't know who you guys would go to because I think you got to Pretty much for those things, I think you got to get somebody in your own area. I'm not positive. Maybe maybe guys do sell that nationwide. I'm not sure. So that's definitely something that that I'd recommend researching for your area and, and all that. But yeah. all of this stuff is 
it, it's it's all stuff. You, what Ron's saying here with like the liability insurance and, and exemptions in areas for certain amounts and stuff like that. I would say your priority here, because someone asked, how should I prioritize this? When, when should I get what? What I would recommend is go look, look online, do some research in your area, see what you need and talk to people. Reach out to someone like like Ron in your area who's been doing it and ask what they would recommend you do. Hey, would you agree with that, Ron? Just, Absol- just ask them. Absolutely. And, and the first time that I heard that I lost an account over the workers' comp thing, I would probably obtain workers' comp that next day. You know, yeah. because obviously you've got a competitor that is 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 using that. And uh, one of the other things, too, I don't think people really uh, give merit to. Um, there's certifications out there. There's paid certifications. There's free certifications. I would obtain a certification. I think that I think that people out there that are smart consumers, let's face it, home sometimes, even if you're home or even if you're working on a on a, on a retail center, a big shopping center, big building, these are investments for these people. And a home is usually the biggest investment a person has. And yeah. w- the, the bottom line is if you mention that you have certifications and you sell that in, 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 in your, in your program, um, guys out there that have been doing this for 20 years say, Ron, no consumers ever even ask me if I've been certified. No one is going to ask you. Okay. They're going to assume that you're going to tell them because your other two competitors mentioned that they were certified and they had it in their marketing. So they're not going to ask you if you're certified. They're going to just say, honey, I I don't see he's certified, so let's hire the guy that's certified. I think certifications are a, a great thing. I think that guys think that they're just a marketing tool. I think if you're if you're out there trying to buy a certification, it's going to be a marketing tool. Don't do that. So don't use that certification. Use one that's accredited and that means something, and that the consumer can actually link back to credential, saying, "Hey, look at this, honey. They have to be in business for this amount of time. They have to do this many credit hours. They have to do this much continuing education. They have to do this, this, that, and this. They have to have insurance. They have to have workers' compensation mm-hmm. insurance in order to in order to carry this carry this certification. Those yeah. things right there build more." trust in the customer than I think that a lot of, than, than a lot of things. And people, people dis I guess guys don't want to pay. I mean, and nobody wants to pay and check it out guys. I'm not going to mention any names out there. There are paid ones and there are free ones. And believe me, some of them are just as good as the free ones are just as good as the paid ones. So investigate, do your time, do, do your due diligence out there and, and do something like that. And remember, Continuing education is important, and I'm gonna tell you, it's important to every consumer, every consumer out there. And that that was my next question. That you're already kind of hitting the nail on the head here. We've talked about a lot of costs with with equipment, starting up a business, all that. How much would you recommend if they're starting with X amount of money? How much of that should they devote to investing in themselves? Oh man, I I would say. As much as is needed, I, I I wouldn't even put a I wouldn't even put a, I wouldn't even allocate that in the budget. I would say it's an open it's it's it, how much money do you have? You better put as much money as is needed for you to for you to expedite that learning curve as fast as you can. There's nothing that will spend and waste more money than ignorance. Uh, mm-hmm. If you yeah. if you come into this and you're kind of bumbling your way around and you got the blinders on, you're going to waste and bleed money. So if you invest in yourself out of the gate and you keep investing in yourself and keep returning that money into yourself, the money's going to keep coming in, believe it or not. It's going to keep pouring in. If you do nothing and you're out there just kind of with the blinders on and you're doing your feelers, you're going to bleed money and money's just going to keep going out the door. So to that question... There's no allocated amount. It's it's going to be whatever it takes for you to drive that learning curve down as low as you can get it. And I've got guys that have been around for five years that didn't want to spend any money on education. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna tell it like it is. They don't even know how to downstream, okay? Because they didn't invest in themselves. And downstreaming is what 98 percent of our industry uses to clean uh, uh, most substrates. 98 percent of the guys. You've been in the business for five years and you've never even heard of downstreaming or you don't know what it is. You're running around with the blinders on. And, uh, well, I guess you thought you were the smartest person in the room. I guess that's what it is. Because everybody that thinks they're the smartest person in the room is usually not the smartest person in the room. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so now 
as someone who's listening to this podcast and saying, oh my God, I need to invest in myself. What resources do you recommend, Ron, that someone goes to first, whether it's books, podcasts, events that train, training events? Uh, you, know, you, you, you know, you're saying that and, and we have a free, TKIM's got a free training event in Greensboro coming up mm-hmm. in July. Go to nationalcleaningexpo.com. I put on free events all over the, all over the country. So you can check out nationalcleaningexpo.com. Uh, most all the events that I have listed on there are free events that I put on and I'm going to be there. Um, by far, they're the best beginning training events that, that exist. And a lot of times there's stuff, there's even stuff there that's advanced. Uh, that we have as far as it goes. And sometimes there's even sometimes there's added on paid training uh, that you can get. Do I promote one training group over another training group? I've got instructors out there that I could tell you that are, I'm not going to say it on this podcast, but there are instructors <laughs> that are just better than other instructors, you know, whether they're paid or whether they're free. They're, and then we all know this, there's always bad doctors, right? So you call up your doctor and say, hey, man, don't let Dr. George operate on her knees. You'll never walk again. You know what I'm saying? You know, so, so you, you, you call people in the industry and you do your due diligence and you, one thing people don't realize, customers will sell for you, okay? So if you know other contractors that have been to these training events and that have been to these instructors, get some feedback from them. Get some private feedback from them. They'll be honest and candid with you. Yeah, they'll be like, yeah, we went to it, and it, it was kind of a beginner thing. We didn't learn a lot. We, we learned some, but we didn't really – we thought we were going to get more out of it than we did. And, and then you have to look within yourself. And I, I'm, I'm going to give another – I'm going to give a this – is a, this is a huge piece of advice. Huge piece of advice. Be a good student, okay? If you go to a training event as, a, as I know everything and you don't want to absorb anything and you just know it all and you don't want to be coachable, it's called coachable, and be yeah. a good student and go there to learn and listen and open your damn ears, okay, you're not going to get anything out of it. Save your money, stay home. I mean, because if you want to be coachable, you got to go to these things Sit straight up in the chair. Don't slouch. Sit in the front and listen and and get interactive with it. Um, and then the biggest thing, man, this is another big thing, action. Yeah. Put what oh, yeah. you learned into action. Everybody goes to these things, and, and some of these guys I'll see, at, they're at the fifth one, the fifth free training event. And I'll be like, is this your fifth free training event? Yeah. yeah. Are you? Uh, how's things going? Well, I haven't started yet. What do you mean you haven't started? You you don't go to five free training events and not start. You know, you you got you got to you got to get up the bootstraps, pull them up, and get out there and and mm-hmm. beat the pavement. And sometimes, guys, it's just beating the pavement. Everybody goes, well, Ron, how did you do it? Man, I would stay out until midnight if I didn't make that sale. Knocking on doors, man. I know you're going, midnight? Are you crazy? Yes. Okay. I sold commercials. So a restaurant guy was just shutting down his restaurant, and I'll be damned. He had time to talk to me. So I would talk to him, and he thought I was crazy too, but he was like, wow, this guy's here at midnight. He's hungry. Okay. And not Mm -hmm. desperate, hungry. I wasn't desperate. I was hungry because I wasn't going to lower my shorts and lower the price to get a job, but I wanted to get a maintenance account because I want maintenance accounts. That's, this is a whole nother thing, a whole nother topic to talk about, but I wanted maintenance accounts and I had a goal and I wasn't going in before that goal was met. Okay. And that's the same way I would train my salespeople when I train my salespeople that, Hey, we have a goal. We have a quota, just like cops have quotas for writing tickets. We have a quota for how many maintenance agreements we want to get each day, and we're going to get those. And here's the thing. This goes back to the accountability factor. Uh, Guys talk about systems, okay? And and I got to mention this too. Guys talk about systems. Systems aren't anything without some accountability. They mean nothing. All, 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 All systems are in a book are some boring reading Okay, and if you've got a manual that's this big and you're expecting one of your employees to read it and digest it and follow it, you're out of your mind. Okay, because it ain't never going to happen. And I'll simplify. I'll simplify accountability on systems that we're all going to get this. And we all know this. We've all been we've all been in a bathroom, 
a public restroom. We've all seen the damn thing on the back of the door where Jimmy signs that it's clean. Okay? Oh, yeah. Jimmy comes in. We're standing in the bathroom. I'll just say we're washing our hands. Jimmy comes in, walks in the door, does this, this, and this, and goes, and signs the thing and walks back out. He wasn't in the bathroom eight seconds, okay? And he said that the bathroom was clean. Now, there's four or five stalls in there. I had to clean the stall before I was able to even use the dang thing. But here, Jimmy went in there and signed the back of it, okay? Now, here's how accountability comes into point, and you'll notice this now. Jimmy has to sign this thing, but now his manager has to come in and sign it after him. Well, that changes the whole thing. Now Jimmy's in the bathroom for four or five minutes making sure the bathroom's clean because now Jimmy has to sign it and the manager has to come in behind him, inspect it, and sign it. Does that mean the manager comes in every time? No, if you look at the thing, the manager only checked it three or four times a day. But it might have been that time when Jimmy did, did, did the inspection, and then Jimmy would be in Dutch if it was found dirty. So that's just a little bit of accountability measure showing that if you have some accountability on a system, it'll work a little bit better. Does that always cure your employees from doing the right things? No. But yeah. but not doing it at all is going to ensure yeah. that they are not going to do their job. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And you can do that with pictures and you can do it online now and, and have accountability that way. Absolutely. But- Taking photos now would be the new thing, right? I mean, I, I don't even imagine if, a ba- if they would even do that. Would they sign on their work app now and take pictures of each commode and a uh, general picture of the bathroom? You're right. That's probably how they would do that now. There, there's... So much to be to do here as you're starting these businesses. What what would you say if someone's bogged down now? You talked about action, right? Like you go you go to one of these events for or training to learn all about it. You come back and you you're overwhelmed because you have so much to do. What would you say to someone who needs to be like re excited about this? What, basically, what I'm trying to get as get at is someone who's starting one of these businesses, how do you excite them? What would you say is something they should be excited for? What's the possibility? What could they they build with this business if they do it right? They're going to learn and then they're going to wonder if they had a job, why they ever work for somebody ever, Mm -hmm. if they do it right. And they're going to understand, they're going to have an understanding that no matter what it is, okay, so when you learn these skills to be an entrepreneur, whether it's underwater basket weaving, scuba diving, flying (laughs) your own plane, whatever it is, you are never going to want to go back to work for anyone ever again, okay? Mm -hmm. You will never work for anybody ever again if you actually get it, okay? Because once you learn, once you possess these tools, you, you never have to go to back, back to work for anybody. And if you don't like washing bus stops, take those skills and apply them to something that you like doing. Because that's the number one thing that you have to realize. You have to like what you do. If you don't yeah. like what you do, don't do it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Did I answer that question? Yes, you did. So, yeah. And I, I guess what I was trying to get at there is like, you had just talked about the like what do they call the protocols, the standard of practice, right? The, those the the books people have, the manuals, right? SOP, standard operating yeah. procedures. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Here, SOP. Here's one of them right here. They don't. No one reads it. Yeah, that's so, it. <laughs> one thing about a business, while you're starting a business, you have to write things down, right? Because if it's in your mind and just up here, it's not real. It, it has to be on paper, you, and that can you know what I suggest? I don't do anything. I don't write anything down anymore. I pick up that phone and I make a video and I put the video mm-hmm. in a log and the video now becomes the training manual because, yeah. because we all know now nobody wants to read. Nobody yeah. wants to read. Everybody wants to look at pictures and yeah. videos and that's what they want to look at. And if you need to explain how to roll the silverware at a restaurant, I guarantee you they got a video that the employee can watch and learn how to roll the silverware because nobody is picked. Yeah. How to exactly. roll silverware. 
Hmm. So, yeah, that's the thing. So the, the SOPs here, every, every, it's a buzzword now because everyone said, get it on one page and that way you can grow your business. So the reason why I was asking, like, what should people be excited for? What can they create? Is because you can build a beautiful big business and you can build a business for the life you want, to give you the lifestyle once, you want. Right? Once, you've, once you've done it, once you've done it for yourself, it's a matter of repeat and replicate, replicate yeah. and repeat. Once you're, you know what, you know what, you know what guys always do? Man, we're doing so well. We can make it better. We're going to change it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And then they go, what happened? You changed it. Mm -hmm. If it's working, don't fix it. Keep yeah. replicating and repeating what's working. If it's working, everybody always thinks they can make the numbers better sometimes. You are doing something a lot of times, and people don't realize this, the very the, the simple things work. Simple things work. Complicated things don't work. When it, you it's start making little, things. It's those it's, little it's, things that build the foundation that gets yeah. you where you want to be. Like, and, people get a, and people get away from them. They get away from them because it couldn't be this easy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you mean you mean this is it? I, I can't believe this. I made ten thousand dollars, and it was that simple. You know, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, and and sometimes they don't understand that, and then they want to make more. I guess they want to put pile on more. I call it fat. They want to pile on fat, and they want to get more employees and more people doing things, and interject all these different things into it. It's like this argument uh, in the commercial world. We only have one tech, one operator, okay? Mm -hmm. And guys will put the guys will be like, "No, man, we have three guys. It's dangerous. You got to have more than one person." Blah 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 blah. They can move faster. And you go out to the you go out to their job site. There's a guy standing there holding the hose, okay? One guy working, and the other guy's having on a smoke break in the truck, or he's using the bathroom, okay? And then they rotate and they'll do that. And a lot of times, and then they often take longer to do the job than one guy would have done. And I can win this argument every time. Now, I can't win this argument if it's owner operator, okay? Because we are, we're not taking breaks, man. We're not doing anything. Yeah. When we go out there, it's dollar signs and we go and we don't stop and we get the job done. Time is money for us. That's all, all, time, that's all that matters. Time is money. Now, when you, when you, do that and you and you and you understand that sometimes when you put all those layers on you're you're just fattening up and decreasing your profits and yep. what happens is, is people start realizing what am i doing wrong we were, were we were making money we're losing money uh i don't understand we got bigger cuz we hired more employees Getting bigger by hiring more employees don't mean you're getting bigger. <laughs> more yeah. revenue producing means you're growing, not not because you got 20 employees, you got bigger. And I and I and sometimes it behoves me because I'll hear I'm going to use an example of somebody. We just yeah. broke a million dollars and we've got 60 employees and 22 trucks. You're in a lot of debt. Okay. What's your profitability? Yeah. yeah, I mean that's just like you you bought yeah. a lot of money and you you and 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 and, and if soon the bubble is gonna burst is gonna burst yep. on you because yeah. you if yeah. you got sixty employees you should be doing five million dollars not oh, yeah. not 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 just breaking the million dollar mark you oh, know yeah. so and, Ron Ron you go to these shows all the time I've been to a ton of events where you hear people comparing revenue and at the end of the day whether you're a one man shop or you have a hundred employees what what matters is profitability right Doesn't yeah you know right. you know I'll even tell you what matters even more what matters more is what you have tangible assets when you're done mm. at the end of the day. Cause I know guys that have made millions of dollars and had to loan them money. Okay. Millions of dollars. And then I know guys that made less money and they could loan me the money to loan them. Okay. Because they had more, they, they made more net profit. And I think people, people don't understand that. But even if you make net profit and you make more net profit than another business is making more, more gross revenue, it still doesn't matter if you don't keep it, okay? Yeah. Nothing matters unless, here we go again, investing that money into something that's tangible, an asset that you can say you have, 
at the end of this run because pretty soon the run's going to end, right? N- nothing, nothing lasts forever. You know, yeah. you love, you may love what you're doing, but one day you're going to have to hang up your wand or or your put your lawnmower away if you're a landscaper or throw put your brush away if you're a painter, and it's going to end. And the person that wins is the one standing with the most assets at the end of that run. Not the one that made the most gross revenue, not even the one that made the most net revenue. Because if you spend the net revenue and you don't keep it, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So about that, how much should people be re- reinvesting in their company uh, when they're just starting out? I should, think should you, you got to put don't... everything. You got to put everything back into your company when you're first starting out. Everything, and you have to take, <laughs> and you have to take a chunk if you're eating rice or beans, and you have to put it away for those assets mm-hmm. first. You have to do that first. Boom. And then you have to reinvest what you're going to invest in in your business. And you have to do that. If you don't do that, you'll never see the day of light, uh, the light of day. I mean. You'll never see yeah. the light of day. Never see the light of day. Absolutely. So, Ron, this has been an amazing conversation for, for any pressure washer that or, or future pressure washer that's looking to start a pressure washing business. And so if someone's looking to, to find you, to talk to you, where, where do they find you? Pressure Washing Institute, National Cleaning Expo, ronmusgraves.com, that Facebook page. Hey, you know what? Google Ron Musgraves and see what you find. <laughs> Yeah, Ron is not hard to find. But if you want to see Ron in person, Ron, you had mentioned come the T-Chem. To, come to T-Chem down there, guys. We're going to be having that in July. Uh, it's going to be the 20th and 21st. Go to nationalcleaningexpo.com. Get registered up. There's going to be an amazing host of people that are coming to that event. Matter of fact, the schedule will probably be up in the next 10 days. Uh, it's going to be an amazing, amazing show. There's going to be some. There's going to be lots of hands-on training, and there's going to be some business building and some marketing and sales stuff uh, by some great guys that are coming out there. Great guys that are coming out there. It's going to be a. It's going to be a really good show, guys. It's in July, so whether you've been in business for 20 years, we all know July is a catch-up for guys that have been in for 20 years. For new guys that just started this thing, you're going to be dead. You're not going to have any business this year. July is a dead month for everybody. Now, you'll say, no, no, so-and-so who's been doing this for 20 years tells me he's busy all the way through July. Ask him again. It's a catch-up. He's four or five weeks out, and July is going to be his catch-up month until he goes into the fall. And that's exactly how this industry works. Uh, Been doing it for 37 years. So there's going to be a lot of time for you when you sit there and go, I can't come in July because I'm going to be too busy. You will not be busy. Yeah. So, so get registered, get your hotel room, and get to the event. So you can find me there as well. You can come say hi to, to both Under Pressure and the Pair Payments crew. We'll be there. We'll be actually doing a podcast event there. So come down to TCAM in July. See me, see Ron. Awesome uh, stuff. After, yeah, absolutely. So can you say that website one more time just for anyone National looking for NationalCleaningExpo.com. Get, get registered there. Just nationalcleaningexpo.com. Just dial it in, and uh, it'll take you right to the registration. And like I said, a bunch of other events on there too, guys. Hey, man, I want to I want to talk about Pear. No yeah. one I tell about it believes that it's free. Tell me about it a little bit. Oh yeah, so <laughs> it's for five dollars a month. We eliminate your credit card uh, credit card bill. So essentially, you're passing the fee on to the customer. This is with no fee processing. Pair does traditional processing as well. But um, for the no fee processing, it's $5 a month to eliminate your whole credit card bill. Wow. You push the fee on to the customer. And if they don't like that, you can give them a checking option as well online. That's crazy. That's good stuff. Good stuff. It, it's so powerful because not only are you eliminating that fee every month, every year, and, and it really adds up what that credit card fee is. Not only are you lim- eliminating that, but think of the opportunity cost there. If you could save X amount per year, not only are you saving it, you're reinvesting that back in your business. You're putting it in marketing and you're growing even faster. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Yeah. Good to hear. <laughs> glad to be glad that the, glad that you'll be out at the event. It's going to be awesome stuff. Absolutely. So thank you so much to Ron Musgraves for coming on the show and, you know, really helping us get a perfect episode for starting from scratch. Uh, we will have Ron on again. We'll have some live episodes with Ron. I'm very excited to, to be having you on the show. And um, thank you to the audience for tuning in today. We will see you next week. 
Thanks for listening. If you haven't subscribed, go ahead and smash that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit the bell so you won't miss our next episode. This episode was produced by Jake Aronson. This has been a Pair Payments production.